Morning. Different straight away. I have been reviewing how I can save time on my messages. I waste a lot of time in my introductions. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, <laughs> verse 6. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. There's the scripture. So I decided in this series, that's genius. What's genius? Generosity is genius. Generosity is genius. Go back, listen to last week's. But what does it look like in reality? What does that text look like with skin on? What does it mean to live that out? And so about a week ago, I asked this young man here, to, uh, to share that. So we're going to have a conversation. It's not scripted. We're going to have a conversation about that. Um, that's the plan, and then I'll preach, depending on the length of the conversation. <clears throat> okay? We all good? Everybody, this is Adam. Beyond the screen, this is what I put who Adam is. He's a husband, a dad, an elder, a pharmacist, and a really cool guy. <laughs> that's, that's what I, this is who I think Adam is. But Adam, explain to everybody else who you are, in addition to all of that, talk to us about family, life, business, history. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, first, thank you for uh, letting me have the opportunity to share with you guys today. I didn't get a choice. I didn't get a choice. No. And I didn't get a lot of notice either, like you no. said. No. <clears throat> so we'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, my family and I have been uh, members of Grace, or attending Grace, I should say, since 2012. Um, I have a wife, Brianne, uh, and two daughters, Allison and Brooke, who are now 10 years old in the fifth grade program. And our experience with Grace has been um, kind of neatly divided into two halves, what I would say in looking back. The first of which, we were um, attendees. We came to church. We listened to the sermons. We came more Sundays than we didn't. Um, and we had a life group, and we knew a few people, and then we would go home. And that was kind of our experience. And then we had a few things that happened in our lives around 2015 or so um, that, that made a big impact on our lives and then kind of our, what I would define our church experience since then, which is much more actively engaged uh, in the body of Christ here at Grace Community Church. So 2015... What was going on in 2015 to define that with your family and all, just and business? Just give some information to help us understand what was life like for Adam and the McCown family in 2015 that resulted in a, a change okay. in that season. So, um, my daughters are 10. Uh, they were born, uh, they're twins, um, born in 2011. It was a complicated pregnancy, some health issues and things. And, um, but regardless of that, just raising twins is nuts. Uh, <laughs> and we were kind of drowning. I mean, that's the best that you can just do is try to survive day to day. Uh, it, uh, up until about the time they were four, and then things started to get easier um, a little bit. And then we felt like we were kind of okay. And then um, I had the bright idea of uh, starting a small business right then. So just as soon as we weren't feeling like we were drowning, then I drowned us again. So, um, so it, was, it, it was a lot of kind of survival. So what, what, what was the business or what is the business? Uh, it, it, it's a pharmacy. Um, we, we opened a, uh, that's how, where I met my wife actually, it was in pharmacy school um, in Seattle, and then we got married. In Good the, chemistry, here. obviously. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Sorry. Whoa, whoa. Unscripted, unbelievable. Um, 
But anyway, but so uh, something happened in our lives uh, soon after that, and we opened up a small business, and that comes with it a lot of hard work and not a lot of financial reward in the beginning. It takes a while to take off. We've got medical bills. We've got differing incomes and things where kind of our security blanket wasn't there like we were used to. Um, And I can remember... um, a message um, that David Butler shared, and I was sitting right over there, um, and he shared, and I won't go into the details of his story, but it was, it, it sounded a lot like he had gone through what I felt like I was going through, uh, and it really resonated with me, and it was about faithfully giving through seasons of hardship. It's not, let's wait till everything feels nice and easy. It's what it looks like in, through that process. And about the same time, my wife um, was with one of my daughters at Phoenix Children's. They were going through some tests. She was in the waiting room. She was listening to a sermon and praying. And to hear her tell the story, she had an overwhelming presence of the Holy Spirit um, and the goosebumps and all the things that go with it. Uh, and she said the, the, the message was, don't you trust me? I've got you, you know. So, so she called me that day, and um, and she said, "Look, I, you know, she told me about what happened. She said, I, I think we should be giving to the church." And I said, "Okay," <laughs> because and and I can remember the, when we were talking about this this past week, there wasn't a lot of fight about it or you know consternation between us in that moment because we had both had that experience of of what, of, you know, God speaking to us. And, um, and so the story since then is that we've been uh, giving to grace since then, consistently and faithfully, and there have been hard times since then. It doesn't make everything easy. It doesn't make life um, free of complications, but it does mean that we have a much stronger faith and trust in God, and we are invested in a church home that is a support system and a community for us here. So, so I hear a couple of things there is that it didn't make human logical financial sense to step in then, no. but at the same time, life was hard, but there was something about, do you trust me? Yeah. That was the, that was the turning point, but you didn't just at 2015 go, oh, so the next season is we just give money, we get God off our back, he blesses us, everything gets better. You, were, you went way beyond that and went, when it comes to being generous, it's not just about our money or our stuff, but it's also about our time. So you're a young family with young twin girls with some health things going on, and then you start to give, but you didn't just give financial, you gave your time. Share with us about what did that look like and the why and how that came about. Yeah, so share that part. Um, okay, so about the same time, maybe a few months later, we, like I said, we were in a small group and we had a few families. Um, <clears throat> and um, one of them, uh, her name was Lydia, came up to me totally unannounced and said, we need help in student ministries. You can help like that. (laughs) And I was like, whoa. And that was not a thought on my mind at all. Um, And I, my initial reaction was, I mean, that sounds nice, but I'm way, way, way too busy. I don't think you really understand the demands that work has on life and taking care of kids and wife at home and all these things. I'm juggling so much I don't have time for that. That was my initial. But I thought about it, and I prayed about it, and I went and talked to the student ministries director um, about that time, and he said, yeah, come on. We, yeah, we need help. So, you know, can you come next Sunday, <laughs> basically? And he said, um, where, where would you like to help? And I was like, well, what do you need? And he said, well, we need help with either high schoolers, uh, 10th grade, or 8th graders. And I said, are you giving me the choice? 
Uh, I'll take the high schoolers. Thank you very much. <laughs> But I didn't know this at the time because, again, I, we, we were still kind of in that attendee phase, but the group of guys that I had a chance to, to be a part of for three years was a, was a big group of guys, several of which are in the room today. Um, just, just pause. If you were in Adam's group, 10th grade, senior year, etc., come on, boys, you're not shy. I won't stand up. I won't stand up. Tim's here. Here, Joel's here. There's the, look where they are. Look where they sat this morning as part of this. And this is going how many years ago now? It's 20, your sophomore year. What, what's 2016? Four, five years ago. Five, five years. years ago. Five, five years ago. So, really, so thanks, guys. Carry on, Adam. Well, and, and what I found was that the group of guys that were there were a part of. Um, families that have been invested in this church for decades um, on leadership and members and their parents had gone to church here, their grandparents in some cases had gone to church here. And so I just had this automatic avenue towards meeting people and knowing people that were already invested here. And my wife uh, shortly thereafter started serving in children's ministry um, and has many friendships from that that we wouldn't have otherwise. And she was able to be there along with our girls as they've gone through and they're about to, scary to think, they're about to age out of that and go to the student group. Um, But um, after those guys graduated, the next Sunday, it really was the next Sunday, um, Taylor was over here on the stage playing the keyboards and Des made this announcement. It's like, hey, we need help. Taylor shouldn't be playing the keyboards. He's supposed to be up here singing. Who knows how to play the piano? And I was one Sunday removed from my responsibilities in the student ministry and not really knowing what to do. And it was like this little spotlight shone down on me. And I was like, I know how to play the piano. But, <laughs> but so then I got to meet the entire worship team, which is a big team, and I get to know that many more people that are in the family and <clears throat> are in the congregation, and I say family because that's what it, that's what it grows to be. So, so correct me if I'm wrong, what, I, what I'm hearing here is if you sow generously, you seem to reap generously. I'm not talking money there. You sowed into the life of some high school guys for three years who are all now 21-year-olds, but it opened your world bigger. And then the moment that they graduate, it's like, okay, what do I do now? Boom, you're already available. And you already know the genius of being generous. And then next thing is serve playing piano, playing keys. And now you're even an elder at the church, second year in. Um, And he's got every reason he can't afford it. Do you see that phrase? Can't afford the time. Can't afford it. Or is it can't afford not to? It's fascinating. Um, let me give you a bit of a free reign here as we wrap up this moment. Here's the crowd of people and many people online all over the world. When it comes to this whole genius of generosity, let it rip. If they feel uncomfortable, I'm even happier. So just what is it you would want to say to people when it comes to a moment where you may be procrastinating. When I give this, when this happens, when the girls are older, when the business is off the ground, when, 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 but you went, no, you were in a moment and God said, do it, and you did it. So what else do you want to share with that about the heart of being generous? <clears throat> well, when, uh, when Des asked me to be a part of this, which was like, like he said, a week ago, yeah. so... <clears throat> I was kind of, thanks for the notice, appreciate that. Um, I started listening to some sermons and things, I, people much wiser than me, and making sure that I have my thoughts together and things. Um, and I noticed a pattern, different pastors in different churches around the country, in teaching about tithing or offerings, somewhere in their message, they all inserted this, kind of this like disclaimer about, now don't get closed off yet, and I'm sorry if we have to talk about money and in the, in these kinds of things, and just a, the acknowledgement at least that it's an uncomfortable topic, and it makes people bristle, and I don't really have, want to have to talk about it, 
because then people are going to be like, I didn't come to church for the church to ask me for my money, whatever. So that, that was kind of this theme that I started. But I think that kind of mi- misses it. If, if, if the message that's heard is the church just wants my money, that's not the message. Uh, in in a, a scripture that was shared in one of the messages in Malachi says, God says, test me on this. He doesn't say trust me. He says, test me. It's like, you know, I'm daring you to do this. And then watch as the floodgates of heaven get opened up on you. And blessings. And so what I think the message should be is that um, we believe uh, that God is at work in this church here now, and we get a chance to be a part of that. You can be a passive attendee, or you can be actively engaged in the work of God at Grace Community Church. And that can be, sometimes that topic turns towards where your time is. Sometimes that topic turns towards where your money is. Whatever the subject, the message, the theme is that God is allowing us and inviting us to be a part of his mission. He doesn't need me. He certainly doesn't. He's going to do it with or without me, but he's inviting me to come along. Um, and, you know, that's a, that's a really powerful message. Beautiful. Thanks, Adam. Let's thank him. Awesome, brother. Thank you. Last week, I touched on the heart of Jesus when he says, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. You want to know where your heart is? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That was last week, but the heart behind the heart statement is God saying, where's your heart? And when your heart is aligned with the heart of God, that's life. When your heart aligns with the heart of God, that's life. And he says, and I realize, God, he said, I realize stuff and money throughout human history has been the number one distractor from us solely being loving God. We are drawn to other things. Well, when this, and we're drawn to our stuff and all these different things and the things that we have and all of that is there. It's been throughout human history that has been the case. And so he wants to go for our hearts. There's the transformation. That's what's genius about generosity. So with that in mind, verse 6, I just touched on with Adam about sowing sparingly and reaping sparingly. But next week, I want to lean into that a bit more elsewhere in the scriptures. Let me continue with the text. I'm going to go through it quickly. Verse 7, each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, stick with me on this one. God loves a cheerful giver. I'll explain what that means in a moment. But he says, look, what's in your heart? There's a heart condition. Whatever it is in your heart, and there's a tension there, don't just give it reluctantly or under compulsion. He's kind of almost applying here, I'd rather not receive it if you don't want to give it. And you think, well, that's a bit weird because are we meant to be obedient? Are we meant to just do things anyway and and have some obedience? And yes, there's a tension there, but it's where he's going to. He's not starting with, you don't give ever, ever, ever. I want to get you going. He's starting with, hey, just watch your heart on your giving deal. Because the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And I ask, why? Why? Why doesn't he just want an obedient giver? Because obedience is good. Why, why the cheerful thing? Like, why is it not good enough to just have a, I'm ritually giving, it's all good, I'm consistent, I, it's all God, and I give first, that's last week's message. Why can't we just leave it there? What's with the cheerful deal? The cheerful deal has got everything to do with love and worship. God wants us to love him with everything. And he loves a cheerful giver. And when you are worshiping, to this morning's songs we were singing, if it didn't stir your soul, then come have a conversation. 
something so joyful in recognition and worshiping God, something so, so good. But you see, when we do that, it dethrones the other idols that creep on. And he gets enthroned. But the word cheerful here, I understand the translators putting the word cheerful in. It's cheerful. It's like, hey, there's a joyful posture. He loves a cheerful giver. And some people call it, the Lord loves a happy giver. Here's the root of it. If we were to get an English word that it really is applying itself to, it's the word hilarious. The Lord loves hilarious givers. Hilarious. And you go, what? Let me just process that for a minute. Hilarious givers. If you've ever had a hilarious moment, you're kind of almost out of control, aren't you? You laugh so much that you're like, I need to stop, but I can't stop. And sometimes being hilarious is something just triggered it, and you end up bawling with laughter. You laugh so hard, there's tears coming down your face. It's hilarious. The hilarity is incredible. And even biologically, it's good for you. They've proved it. The scriptures knew it years and years ago. Laughter is like a good medicine. Laughter. There's something about that, and this is where he wants us to go. What if you could get your heart to such a spot where you just think, I've got to do this. I want to do this. Wait for it. This feels awesome. Oh, that's a bit altered. No, 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 no. God's good. And all of his goodness going through you, the generosity of God being through you and you experience that, it's meant to be hilarious. It's meant to be, wow. Have you ever seen people laughing with complete hilarity and you didn't know what the joke was? And you just, you want in, don't you? You're like, what was that? And I, I'm missing out, don't you? What was that? I'm missing out. People are laughing and I missed it. Like, I missed it. What, what? But it's not the same, is it? When they retell it, because you had to be at the right time. You know, or you had to be there to experience it. Think about generosity with this kind of a posture. It shifts it quite a lot. The reason I thought, I knew I want to share this with somebody today. I want somebody to share their generosity in their life is because of this. Rarely, in, it's natural that we get inspired by other people's generosity. Let's go outside of church world. There are TV shows that have been created over years and years and years and years that have inspirational generosity within them. Now, I know they make money off it, but the whole wire in there. In England, there was a show called Secret Millionaire, which you guys call Undercover Boss. The whole undercover boss thing has got nothing to do with, oh, a guy's going to go and see how his company's really working, or a woman who owns a company's going to go in there and see how it's really going undercover. The whole subplot of the whole show is that they get to engage with on-the-ground employees. They hear their story, and out of their wealth, they are able to make a difference in their life. And the inspiration is at that last 10 minutes of the show where they get to say thank you, but they overwhelm them with a generosity they didn't think they deserved. That plot line, that feeling is a human behavior of the generosity being poured out. And all too often you would even see the one whose money it was when they were giving it, they were the ones wiping tears from their face. Not just the ones receiving it. That even takes place and it's in there. Let me just make a clear statement to you. I have yet to come across an inspirational keeping it story. We can come across inspirational generation and generosity stories. They did this, they did this. Generosity coming out. We hear stories and we go, wow, look at that. And it can be massive in number. It could be small and sacrificial, but we get inspired. But I've never heard one of, I had this and I just kept it all for myself. So good. The best thing I ever decided to do. Jesus picked up on that. I'll touch on it next week about a guy who just built bigger barns and bigger barns and bigger barns and it's just all keep it, keep it, keep it, keep it. 
Oh, but that's not me. Not really. Giving, generosity. Is it fun yet? Are you having fun yet? It's the heart of this text. Are you having fun yet? Are you enjoying it yet? I want to say, keep doing it till it's fun. Don't wait for it to be, oh, it's going to feel fun. It's not going to start with feel fun. It's going to start with feel faith. As Adam shared, don't you trust me? It may be going to start there, but, but what I'm leaning towards is, is it fun yet? And some of you are like, this is a bit weird. I thought it meant to be very dutiful and obedient. I'm not dismissing that. But God wants you free. And why would he say he wants us to be hilarious givers? The joy factor is a key to this. And what's going to help us get there? With your generosity, are you having fun yet? I decided this morning, I'm looking through my stuff, it's early in the morning, and I asked myself this question, is it fun yet? Are you generous, Des? And how does that feel? Is it fun yet? And I gave myself a score. I'm not at a hilarious level yet. I'm not at a hilarious level. I'm not there yet. Some of you in here are. You can maybe help. I'm just not at a hilarious level yet. But I want to be. Because when a room is full of hilarious laughter, is there anything better? Why do we get inspired with memes of little children laughing uncontrollably and giggling? And you've watched them. And what is that? Well, where am I? And so I was like, where am I and where do I want to? The Lord's like saying, I love hilarious givers. I think the alignment of the heart of God, who is unbelievably generous, and all he does is give, because he so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, something must align and everything from it must be incredible. I'll carry on, verse 8. And God is able. Is he? Is he? And some of it, I don't know yet. Paul writes to these, this church, this is like here, he's writing to this church in Corinth, said, hey, God is able to make all grace abound to you. Please don't read this, just you personal. We have to be careful in the Western world about the Bible just being about me and Jesus. It's not me and Jesus, it's we and Jesus. This is how the scriptures were given. Always about community and together. So when he says that all grace will abound to you, this is what he's saying. So that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And I took that and went, so what you're saying, Lord, is Grace Community Church, God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, wait for it, you will abound in every good work. You are going to be overflowing, outpouring to everybody else around. And God's able for you to do that. You're going to impact and change and transform things you might never, ever touch, but it's going to take place. So then I asked the question about, is this about my heart? Of course it's about my heart. So then I wrote this down. Some of you are like this, discipleship. Discipleship is becoming more like Jesus. Not knowing more about Jesus. Becoming more like Jesus. Becoming Christ-like. Christ in me. That's what I want to get towards. Am I becoming more like him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I reflected on this and said this. I am never more like Jesus than when I'm giving and forgiving. Period. Period. Whoa, whoa, seriously. I'm never more like Jesus than when I am giving and forgiving. Because that's Jesus. When it comes to giving, he gave it all. And if you read the narrative of his story all the time, it was always giving. 
and forgiving. And the purpose of me being forgiven by him and receiving that, I have opportunity to forgive others. The purpose of forgiving others is not for their benefit. It's for mine. Because it releases the infection of me becoming bitter. It's a bitterness vaccination. Forgiveness. Forgiving. I am never more like Jesus when I am giving and forgiving. So for some of you who've been in and around church all your life, I want to become more like Jesus. I'm just going to say this. The answer isn't memorize more. The answer is do, do more forgiving and be more giving. That's when you become more like Christ in me. If he is in me, my posture should be giving and forgiving. So what does that look like? Let me get practical in this. And I've had discussion with people. When we first moved to Arizona, and especially in and around Tempe, we recognize there are some people who very much live without. There's homeless communities. There's people who do not have. There are people on each junction of freeways asking for help. And I remember early on having a conversation and I was told, hey, Des, don't fall for it. Don't give to them. Don't give to them because there's a system for some of them that are involved and some of them will just waste it anyway. So really you're wasting your money. It's like throwing your money down the drain. It just don't do it because there's a whole thing there and it's, it's really don't fall for it. And I got told this. Now, I'm not saying that some of that isn't true But I am saying this, when it comes to the condition of my heart, if you pull up at a junction and the Lord says to you, look in your wallet, give it, why is he asking you to do that? He's not asking you because they need it. He's asking you because you need to let go of it. It's a condition of your heart. You're never more forgiving, never more like Jesus when you're forgiving and you are giving. How many things did Jesus do that the people went, why is he doing that? Don't agree with that. But it was an overflow of the heart of his father coming through his hands. We get to be that overflow. And I'm just saying, sometimes you may see somebody in need and just it doesn't call out to you and it's okay. But sometimes if it does, if the Lord's just saying, go on, it's a heart deal. It's just a heart thing. And that's a very simple little example. But it flows after last week's give first mindset, by the way, big time. So, and then it goes on to say this. I'm going to jump to verse 11. It's because of time. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Let me give context here, because the prosperity gospel people go for it here. By the way, there's two kinds of gospel here. There's three. There's the true gospel, middle. There's the prosperity gospel is, if I give to God, I become rich. Yeah? He bless. It's all about me. And then there's the poverty gospel, which is righteousness is demonstrated in poverty. Righteousness is demonstrated with God's blessing. Righteousness is demonstrated in poverty. Both wrong. There's a reality, because here's what the text is saying. The text was written to a church in Corinth in Greece. He's writing to them, and he's saying to them collectively, you, church, you'll be made rich in every way, in every way. When's the last time you paused and stopped and looked at your life and went riches? When's the last time we as a church paused and stopped and went riches? Been blessed in every way. Hearing life change stories and different moment stories and heartfelt stories and people getting alongside people in acute pain and difficulty and struggle and people coming alongside and making you laugh hilariously and all things around that. You'll be made rich in every way, church. There's something about the significance of being engaged in family because that all comes about. And then it says, and on, so that you can be generous on every occasion. I'm going to say it clear. I didn't say it at the nine o'clock. Some of you right now are in a desperate, desperate situation and there's a bill you can't afford to pay tomorrow. Call me tomorrow. Let's see how we can walk alongside you. 
Oh, yeah, but you don't know how much it is. I don't know how much it is. You're right. Don't stop us having the blessing of giving because Jesus said it's more blessed to give than it is receive. But in your life, living with that same posture. And it goes on to say this. You'll be generous on every occasion and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This church, we're gathering this offering together and Paul was going to them saying, so give generously. Where were they giving to? They were giving to the central location of Jerusalem where the church, the gospel, this new movement, this ecclesia, this people of the way, were expanding the good news that Jesus is risen all over the Mediterranean basin. It was going, and that comes with a cost. And so they were saying, let's gather it in in Jerusalem and send, and send, and send, and send. So he said, your generosity to us, through us, will result in many people giving thanksgiving to God. You might never meet them. You might never see them. So let me ask you this. When's the last time you stopped in life and just went, wow? When were you last awestruck by God's goodness? When's the last time you went, oh? When's the last? Because when it comes to your heart, that's where the Lord's leading you. That's when's the last time you just stopped and gave thanks, but even for the impact of it all. I shared it at the nine o'clock. Your generosity, those who give to grace, do you realize there are people hearing the gospel and reading the word of God and singing praises to him in Senegal in their native tongue because you gave? And that's a direct grace community church thing. Specific. Do you know? Wow. When's the last time you thought about it? And to be honest, the shoe boxes is super cool. And it gets you there. But you, are, you won't meet the kid who opens that, whose life, when they open it, a light switch will go from darkness to light. And that impact that gets to happen. When's the last time you just thought, I want the awestruck wonder of the goodness of God. Your heart, the thanksgiving that will come before God will be incredible. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. I'm not saying they should see your giving. I'm saying, but just your heart. Because they shouldn't see your giving. Ask next week, right hand and left hand and all kinds of things. But anyway. It's the heart deal. So, land the plane. Here we go. Yep. Some of you here have been faithfully living out God first, generosity, spontaneity, sacrificially. Some of you with hilarity have been doing this. And I have a word from God for you today. I'm going to read some scripture over your life. You need to hear the heart of the Father and and receive this blessing because of your generosity. It's genius. Some of you, as I'm declaring this, the Lord's saying, do you trust me? But what about living hilarious lives? It starts with generosity. This scripture I'm going to declare is awaiting you. The Lord is ready to say this over your life when you step in and you start to live that way and to give. Absolutely. For some of you, you've been routinely giving and the joy's not there anymore. And just go, Lord, I'm sorry. I want to be hilarious with this one. Help. Help. And so for all of you, I want to ask you in the room, so people, I'd like all of you just to have a posture like this. And that way you're not looking all the ones who've been generous have got their hands open. Just, just all of you do this. And I'm simply going to read Scripture, not preach it. I'm just going to emphasize the last verse when I get to it. But I'm just going to declare it. Because when I read this, I thought, this is the, this is. The Father in heaven declaring words over his children because of their generosity. It says this, 
2 Corinthians 9, and I go from verse 12. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but it is also overflowing in many ex expressions of thanks to God. Wow. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and, within every, and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. King Jesus is saying, guys, I see it, I love it, I'm grateful for it, don't miss the impact of it. This is so good, but thanks be to God for, this, for his indescribable gift. Scholars have looked at what he, was, what he was trying to talk about. Is it the gift of salvation? Yeah. Is it the gift of his church? Yeah. Is it just the gift of grace? Yeah, but when you now wear it all down, here it is. God in heaven loves us so much, he's hilariously generous. He gives all things. He gives and he gives in generosity, and he so loves us, he gives us his one and only son who dies for us, and his own son gives his very everything. It flows down, but there's generosity. The indescribable gift, when all is said and done, is this. You have generously received. You now get to generously give. The indescribable gift is you, there's no end to it. It's indescribable. But it's a gift that you've received, and if you allow it to transform you and go through you, it's genius. It's genius. And I don't have to live in fear, but in faith, because he's the king of my heart. He's the king of my heart. So may the king of my heart be fill in the blank. So we're going to sing that as we close today. If you are experiencing some personal pain and difficulty and struggle, or even you've got some questions about some of this, down front, left and right, at the end of the song, we'll have some of our leaders and our prayer partners who are here just to give of their heart to you in prayer. We're here for you. Don't be isolated and all on your own, because when life for Adam was just about attending... But when it was family and engaged, it was genius, pure genius. Let's pray. King Jesus, I give my life to you today, that my life will be your life. For every single one of us in the room, Lord, help us to surrender all. Help us to discover the joy and the hilarity of being generous as you are generous. And Lord, it isn't about being irresponsible. It's about worshiping and loving you. So with the overflow of our heart, may our actions speak. May we move from good intentions to actions. We sing to you now, Lord, you are our king. You are good. You are good. And the psalmist said, Lord, you are good, and all that you do is good. Teach us your ways. So, Lord, teach us your ways when it comes to generosity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing this together in closing. Prayer partners be down front. See you next week.